Will the clerk please read the next item on today's calendar? House concurrent resolution number 13 by the House Rules Committee relating to the Alaska Permanent Fund. Madam Clerk, are there amendments? Amendment number one by Representative Eastman, beginning page two, line 14. Representative Eastman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I will not be moving amendment number one at this time. So amendment number one has been withdrawn. Madam Clerk. Amendment number two by Representative Eastman, beginning page one, line one. Representative Eastman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move amendment number two. There's an objection. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm calling this amendment the Truth in Advertising Amendment, Mr. Speaker. The uh, first thing this amendment does is it corrects the title uh, on the resolution before us. Currently, the title uh, is very short. It simply says, relating to Alaska Permanent Fund, uh, and this would add to that and permanent fund dividends. And that is more accurate because in this resolution, we have the Alaska Permanent Fund Dividend Program uh, called out a half a dozen times um, in the fifth whereas, the eighth whereas, the ninth whereas, the tenth whereas, and the fifteenth whereas. And because of that, it's appropriate that we include the permanent fund dividend reference in the title. The second thing this amendment does is it uh, goes to page two, lines 14 to 17, and lines 21 to 25, and it eliminates those two whereases. Mr. Speaker, the language there is out of date. It refers to specifically to Senate Bill 26, which was passed by a previous legislature. Uh, I have in front of me the original version of Senate Bill 26, which is in fact accurate if that was the version that had passed. However, that was not the version that passed. And so uh, it's important that we correct that information. Again, going back to titles and recognizing how important titles are. And the original version of the bill, uh, the title Title said relating to deposits into the dividend fund, and that was removed in this in the statute in the bill when it passed. In the original version of the bill, it said relating to uh, unrestricted state revenue available for appropriation. That also was removed in the title and the content of the bill when it passed. Um, relating to the calculation of permanent fund dividends, that too was in the original version of the bill, but not the version of the bill it passed. Mr. Speaker, if if the original bill had in fact passed, I'm, I'm fairly confident that some of us would not be sitting here right now due to the intervening election. Um, there, were, there was an attempt made that that language limit the calculation of permanent fund dividends and limit the money available for permanent fund dividends from the earnings reserve fund, uh, but since that bill was not passed, it's important that we correct this in the resolution before us today. Thank you. Representative Newman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in support of this amendment, uh, particularly the section where it removes section R lines 21 through 25, uh, if I may speak in that regard. Uh, Mr. Speaker, why I don't, why I'm objecting, because I don't feel that that's an accurate statement or a whereas. Um, Mr. Speaker, I sent out or spread out a, distributed a, a balance sheet of the performance of the permanent fund dividend. And even in the whereas prior to that between lines 18 and 21, it identifies a 15% of risk over the next 10 years. That's an 85% risk of success. It's almost seven A's. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'll take a win on $7 and a loss on one all day long. But the bottom line is this, Mr. Speaker, even with about an approximately $4 billion draw off of the permanent fund earnings reserve to, that goes back in to help fund government and pay a full permanent fund dividend as is currently proposed by the governor, would be a $1.9 billion for a full PFD, a billion dollars for follow the rule of law, Senate Pump 26, and $900 million for inflation, which the financial experts argue whether that's even needed or not because uh, it's making inflation plus it's dedicated uh, goal. So it's automatic, automatically inflation proofing. Uh, that's three billion. So if we were even to assume there was four billion, right now the earnings reserve is at, uh, back over $18 billion again. Even with the four billion dollars drawn out of it last fiscal year, at the end of the fiscal year, when the budget bill passed, it's recovered that total, plus in another $600 million already this year alone. The permanent fund dividend has made over $7 billion since July. 
So if we were even to take the $18 billion now, if it never even replenished, by the way, it's replenished at a rate of 10.74% since inception in 1982, and this year is made average 15.71. Even if that never replenished, that's four and a half years of spending into government with a full PFD, every obligation that we have without breaking any rules of law, with never replenishing. And I think that it's very obvious that it's doing very well. Even with the current stock market downturn, we're seeing that. That's why that 10.74% over inception is important. It shows that it's doing well and it's performing well. And I think that the risk on that is inaccurate. And I think that if we put statements like that out there to the public, what it does is they assume that there's issues with that right now. And, and obviously, I don't think the numbers are portraying that. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I also think that it portrays a perception to the public that we need to lock this money away. We've heard about that before. And I think that that's what this says as well. It can be interpreted to me to say that this means that we take all of the earnings reserve and lock it up into the corpus so that we don't have it available when we need it. Mr. Speaker, I've got the opportunity in my career here to talk to lots of financial experts, particularly in financing. Um, they tell me that in hard financial times, you want fluid cash, economics 101. We've got hard economic times. Why would we lock up our cash account that we have? It just makes no sense. And to me, when I read this, it says that we need to protect this and save this. That I'm reading that is code for lock. It's the first step. And maybe I'm wrong, and, and maybe, maybe I'm wrong. But again, to think that to imply to the public there's a loss when obviously it's been performing very well. And maybe now is the time we can use this. And, and I say that now, I don't want to get into it because it would follow off topic, but I'll mention earlier about how I feel it can play into a long-term plan and we can get through this. And maybe the philosophy of getting it all done this year, uh, it hasn't worked. Maybe we got time to get this figured out. So anyhow, Mr. Speaker, I don't want to go too long in the tooth on that. Uh, my comments are um, that I don't feel that that's accurate. I believe that I've distributed correct financial information that stands up behind what I have to say, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak on the floor. Thank you, Mr. Representative Johnston. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I was not going to speak to this amendment, but I just heard something that perked up my ears as far as being able to finance this um, this approach, and I just want everybody to reflect on this past week, our financial markets dropped, as of now, 4,200 points. Our, luckily, we have professional management, managers in the permanent fund, and our asset allocation is diverse. But I want to say that we are not looking at the robust bull market that we have seen in the past couple of years. And I would not count on a robust bull market. I would not count on current estimates as far as the, what we will be getting for oil revenues. We could be heading to some very difficult times and I would like to suggest we all think prudently. Thank you. Representative Kopp. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I do rise in opposition to the amendment and just uh, backing up the uh, remarks of my colleague from District 28, you know, Mr. Speaker, the Dow has dropped 14% of its, lost 14% of its total value in just a few days. The S&P 500 has lost 13% of its total value. Over $3 trillion has been lost. This is now the worst week of correction since 2008. We are back down to those levels. Many of these members here that have been around know that it was 2008, 2009, we almost did not pay a permanent fund dividend because the entire loss is absorbed by our earnings reserve account, not by the whole fund. Earnings reserve account holds the money. We almost didn't pay a dividend that year. It was only because at the very end of the earnings cycle, it rebounded enough that we were able to pay a dividend. Mr. Speaker, this is exactly why this resolution is important. We are seeing 
worldwide depression of oil prices. Oil is about $51 a barrel today. We had hoped for the mid 60s last year. That isn't coming to fruition. Uh, the uh, forecasting of the oil prices continues to go down into the forecasting in the 40s. Um, our revenue stream is at a tipping point. The resolution is necessary. The times we live in is showing how critical it is that we stay within a rules-based framework, and the amendment here seeks to pull out the very thing that the legislators before us had the courage to do, which is to say no matter what, for dividends and state services, we have to stay within a structured draw or we will be in trouble, and the next generation after us will pay the price. For that reason, Mr. Speaker, I hope the body joins me in voting this down. For example, um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I just want to uh, point out uh, one or two things, and I, and I agree with the uh, previous two speakers for sure. Um, and the last week in the stock market notwithstanding, on our desk today was the Alaska Journal of Commerce dated February 23rd. And uh, it said the first half of, of the fiscal year, the fund returned 5.38%. We, we're drawing 5.25%. And, and the speaker from Big Lake, and I, I may have misheard him, but he, he stated how much the fund earned in the first half of the fiscal year. It says here in the, um, in the journal, uh, if I may read, Mr. Speaker, um, in total, the fund's balance grew by nearly $700 million in the first half of the 2020 fiscal year. And I, I thought I heard a different number earlier, but it's $700 million, not, not to be uh, confused with $7 billion. So it grew by $700 million. So it's, and, and these last uh, week and future weeks, we don't know what's going to happen. So I think uh, conservatism should prevail here. Um, structured draw rules should be adhered to. 5.25 is the upper end of what anyone would tell you we should be drawing on a structured draw it goes down to five percent let's not forget and i think that it's very important that we stick to that for the long-term um, security of the permanent fund and to our state represent spontholz thank you speaker edgeman um uh, i oppose this amendment um I think that uh, dividends are essential, and I'm a strong advocate for the permanent fund dividend, um, and will continue to advocate for a robust, as robust a PFD that we can afford. But so is protection of the permanent fund. And for me, the reference to SB 26 that is being stripped out via this amendment um, would be would be highly problematic. This resolution is essentially a statement of values uh, by the legislature and a sort of a recommitment to the principles of SB 26. For me, this is important because in since our since the price of oil dropped, uh, we have the state of Alaska has spent $14 billion from our state budget reserve and the constitutional budget reserve uh, eroding our financial reserves and without honoring the, pr the protections uh, as defined in SB 26, we could run into a situation where the same sort of thing happened to our permanent fund, which is essentially, uh, you know, robbing from our uh, all the future earnings that could come from the permanent fund. And this is especially important uh, now. This year is the first year in our state's history where earnings from the permanent fund uh, are a larger percentage of our state's budget than our uh, revenues from the oil from oil. Um, that makes it incredibly important that we actually lift up and reaffirm our commitment to SB 26 and protect the permanent fund for future generations. Thank you. Representative Craig Tompkins. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I oppose amendment number two. Uh, a, a previous speaker asked the question, why, why would we lock up all the cash in this moment, and I respect asking the question, and I have a uh, robust answer. Um, the reason we want to protect the permanent fund is because if we don't, we will spend all the money. We will liquidate the cash. It will get flushed down the toilet to satisfy short-term budgetary convenience. Uh, my first year in the legislature was 2013. 
strange I am in the upper quartile of seniority of this fine institution. <laughs> and in 2013 was the first year in a while coming out of the oil boom, the state of Alaska was running a budget deficit. It had been heady times of gravy train, high oil prices, ACEs, all that good stuff in the previous years, huge capital budgets. And in 2013, we started spending down the SBR, and we started spending down the CBR thereafter. And every year I've been in the legislature, this is my eighth session, we've had a structural budget deficit, <laughs> and we have balanced the budget, if you can call it that, by spending down our savings. And I've watched uh, somewhere in the order of 13, 14 billion dollars of savings be spent in my seven sessions in the legislature. Just the earning potential of that money for future generations would effectively get us out of the structural budget deficit we're in right now. Just the earning potential of that cash and our savings that we have liquidated in the last seven years. Why has that happened? It's, it's effectively a, a relationship of chicken and egg. It's, it's a lot easier to spend down savings than make the hard budget decisions that every other legislature in the country, the other 49 states in this union have to make, which is you either cut services and or raise taxes. And we have cut the budget and uh, held down the operating budget growth quite a bit. Um, we've failed to raise revenues. Um, but neither of those actions is anywhere close to what we need to balance the budget in a long-term fashion. And so my biggest concern for the future of Alaska is that this legislature, this house, in the future, will spend down the permanent fund just as we spent down the CBR and just as we spent down the SBR. Because for some of us, it's easier to do that than to vote for a tax. And for some of us, it's easier to spend down the permanent fund than it is to cut services. And protecting the permanent fund is the most responsible thing this institution can do. When we spend down the permanent fund, we're effectively taxing future generations. Because when you liquidate a billion or $10 billion now, that earning potential is gone forever. Future generations will not benefit from the earning potential of that money. It's the biggest asset the state has. And for us, through amendment number two, to say that we don't believe in a rules-based framework and a structured draw, which is just fancy financial jargon for saying, for saying we believe in spending within our means and not, not liquidating the permanent fund for short-term convenience at the cost of long-term prosperity, um, it's basically saying we don't care about future generations. Protecting the structured draw on the permanent fund, not spending it down, is the most responsible decision this institution can make. I oppose amendment number two. Brief it is. Will the body please come back to order? Continuing on under amendment number, or on amendment number two, Representative Josephson. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll be just very brief, but in touch on just a couple things that uh, may not have been mentioned. The first is that um, the uh, resolution at the bottom of page two, top of page three, talks about a goal of growing the corpus, uh, I guess the corpus and the ERA effectively, but growing the fund at any rate, um, to a much larger number, gaining a third of its value, that sort of thing, in the next decade, and going even higher in the decade after that. And the value in that is that, although at some point we have to have uh, a revenue discussion, and that, that won't change, um, we could have a day, depending on our population growth, where the fund's 5% uh, draw uh, will largely pay for government altogether. And the concern with an overdraw is that that day wouldn't be reached. I think that's one important topic that hasn't been discussed. The other thing I guess I want to emphasize is that uh, the, the scuttlebutt, be, but beyond the scuttlebutt, the, the expert testimony that I've heard over the years, the white papers, all of those things suggest that the most conservative draw would really be in the range of four to four and a quarter, and we're going to be at five percent. And 
um, to go over 5% is, is just too liberal of a draw. And uh, I think given, as the co-chair noted, the events of the last week that, that a town called Wuhan, China, could make the world uh, turn upside down, if that's all it takes, I think it's wise to be conservative. And that's where I intend to lay and, and, um, and remain. And we just need to be uh, cautious of what we think is a new normal, whether it's we think $125 per barrel oil in the, in the, not, in the aught decade is the new normal. It wasn't. And we think that robust, continual, everlasting bull markets are the new normal. They aren't either. And for those reasons, I'm uh, going to uh, oppose the amendment. Representative Fields. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, really simple question. Are we going to maximize the wealth, not just for future generations, but for current generations like my daughter, who's two years old? The amendment before us um, would be a values judgment that we should liquidate the permanent fund to her detriment. And I guess I would just say, over my dead body, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to know on this amendment. And wrap up. Representative Eastman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and my thanks to each of the speakers who spoke previously. Um, certainly the topic of what's to become of our state spending, uh, what's to become of the dividend, is a live question. Uh, however, the amendment before us does not address uh, that question. This is, again, a truth in advertising amendment, and what it is simply saying is that the title should reflect the fact that this does deal with the uh, permanent fund dividend referenced numerous times throughout the resolution. And it also says that the current version of Senate Bill 26 that was passed by the legislature should be the one we're referencing, not the uh, the bill that was initially written, which did not pass. And Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the reason that that's important is because sometimes we forget, and, and it's uh, understandable, that we are not the only ones who have a voice in the laws that are written in this state. Uh, we are a nation, a state of laws, under Article 11 of our state constitution. When we pass a law, such as the original version of of Senate Bill 26, that then goes to the people and they have an opportunity through a referendum to say yay or nay. In this case, the uh, the bill originally designed to change the calculation of the dividend did not become law. There was no opportunity for the people to speak yay or nay to it until so the current statute stands before us. It's a live question. Let's continue to debate that, but let's be honest and accurate in what we're putting before the people. So I ask support for this amendment. Thank you. Are you ready for the question? The question being, shall amendment number two pass the body? Members may proceed to vote. Will the clerk please lock the roll? Does any member wish to change his or her vote? Will the clerk please announce the vote? Seven yeas, 23 nays. With a vote of seven yeas and 23 nays, amendment number two has failed to pass the body. Madam Clerk. Amendment number three by Representative... Uh, brief, brief it is. Under debate, amendment number three, Representative Josephson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I oppose the amendment because I think it's, it's inaccurate um, in that the current levels of state spending... Uh, on, on those things that people think of when they traditionally think of state spending, uh, that is our operating budget, including statewide expenses, those items have been cut $1.1 billion um, since FY14. That's a cut of 24 cents on the dollar, so we're spending 76 cents where we used to spend a dollar to operate the government. That's the first thing. The second thing is it's unclear where you'd cut. Uh, for example, if you add up K through 12, HES and university, the biggest ticket items in the government, corrections another one, you easily exceed $2 billion. Well, the UGF budget is only about 3.8. Well, what's the balance? Well, it's, it's operating the other 13 departments of government. I mean, th this, this body will see a budget on Monday, published and available today, where this chamber is going to spend somewhere in the range of seven to nine million dollars more than the governor. Well, what does that mean? It means that the governor couldn't cut the budget. Uh, in fact, I think it, in the end, he cut 30 million dollars more than this chamber did a year ago, really both, both chambers. So the spending is what the spending is. There's, the, you're just into the marrow at some point. Now, the ferry system is buying a 22-foot cruiser <laughs> to, 
just to move people around. What's that a response to? It's a response to outrage. That's what it's a response to. So the idea that it's the current levels of government spending that are causing the problem, I think, is just false. And mind you, we're not even talking about the capital budget, the unfunded liability, uh, all of those things, the tax credits, all of those obligations that no one can cut if they wanted to cut them. So, look, we don't raise revenue from the people meaningfully. We're the only state that says we're not going to do that. That's a debate that needs to be had. And we're drawing out of the good fortune and the wisdom of people who built the permanent fund that this resolution addresses. Thank goodness they did it, and thank goodness we inflation proved it. Um, we are blessed with this extra $3 billion of revenue, or we would be in one world of hurt. One world of hurt. And what this resolution says is, stand by that wisdom. That's all this, this resolution says. Um, Mr. Speaker, I, I oppose the amendment. Representative LeBon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I just have a problem with such a bold statement as the two words, greatest threat. And as I th think about the permanent fund and where we are today from its, its very beginning in 1976, what's the threat to the permanent fund? It's, it's several factors. Maybe lack of resource opportunities in Alaska and future oil development investment, the price of oil now and into the future, the throughput of the pipeline, the oil flowing into our uh, pipeline. Uh, investment earnings by the permanent fund, permanent fund mismanagement, we hope that never happens, overspending on the percent of market value approach, the size of the PFD, are you, are you locked into that statutory formula from the 80s? You know, I, I think back at the day when we passed this, the permanent fund law in 1976, the vision of the voters who voted by a margin of two to one to establish a permanent fund was that someday the investment earnings of the permanent fund would substitute for a predictable decline in the revenues earned by the state from the flow of oil down the pipeline. The price of oil is a wild card. Who knows? We've seen that volatile up and down over the years. But the throughput of the pipeline, the resource for the state was going to shift from oil and the investment opportunity down here over 40 Five years, it is flipped. And as was mentioned by the representative from Anchorage, that reality has occurred. It's taken longer for it to occur than we thought, but the greatest threat to the, the permanent fund is not state spending. It's how we manage the resource, and we try to develop additional oil resources, and we promote resource development in the state now and into the future, and that is why I'm opposing this amendment. Representative Prox. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I was around, as was the representative from District 1, when we voted on this, and my expectation clear back in 76, I think it was, was that it would, creating the permanent fund would take money um, off of current, an expected dramatic increase in income, would take that away from the, the temptation to spend it and make that money and the earnings from that fund available for a day like today. But the uh, the question of whether spending is a threat, I believe it is. The, the Since 76, having been here, watched it, state spending has grown considerably more than I think anyone at that time expected it would. Even with putting the money into the permanent fund. So I still think that's the biggest threat. And now just taking money you know, out of the economy, away from potential for people, to put it in the permanent fund as an end in itself, almost strikes me as hoarding, uh, if you will, the king hoarding the money. Foster. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, um, I also oppose the amendments. Uh, I'd like to expand on what uh, members from both uh, House Districts 16 and 17 have said. Um, with regard to the current levels of, of government spending, I'd like to point out that um, from our high point, um, we've reduced spending from $7.8 billion in FY13 um, to $4.3 billion in FY20. And that's a cut of $3.5 billion. Um, so we've reduced our government spending by 45%. Our own legislative finance has told us that under one scenario, uh, we could have a full statutory dividend by reducing uh, government spending. And in that scenario, we would have to eliminate 16 of the 18 agencies that the state of Alaska has. Um, that would leave two agencies. That would be the Department of uh, Education as well as the Department of Health and Social Services. But in that scenario, if, if you wanted to have a full statutory dividend, reducing 16 of the agencies, that would mean that you'd have to eliminate public safety, which means getting rid of every single trooper and every single trooper vehicle. You'd have to get rid of corrections, that means getting rid of every state prison, every correctional officer in the state. You'd have to get rid of the judiciary, and that would mean getting rid of every court and every judge to put folks who are committing violent crimes into the corrections, into the prisons. You'd have to get rid of the Department of Law, and that would mean getting rid of every prosecutor. You'd have to eliminate fish and game, which means no more management of our wildlife resources. You'd have to eliminate Department of Labor, which means getting rid of uh, the state's um, uh, portion of training uh, folks so that they can uh, work in the uh, state's workforce. You'd have to get rid of the Department of uh, Military and Veterans Affairs. You'd have to get rid of the entire university system. That means getting rid of the University of Alaska Fairbanks, University of Alaska at Anchorage, University of Alaska at Southeast, and all the community campuses. Mr. Speaker, again, you'd have to eliminate 16 of the 18 agencies to get a full statutory PFD, and that would finally include, you'd have to get rid of the Department of Transportation, um, and that means getting rid of every single per DOT worker um, and snow clearing equipment, uh, folks who, uh, the, the equipment that fills the potholes. So yes, we can do it. We can reduce state uh, spending, but this is what that would look like if you want to pay a full statutory PFT. So with that, Mr. Speaker, thank you. Representative Ortez. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I rise in opposition to the amendment before us. However, I would like to commend uh, the representative from uh, District 27, as well as District 10, um, for bringing forward their amendments today. I think it's promoted uh, some great conversation, some conversation that needs to be had. And, um, and I commend the entire floor so far for the decorum that has been put forward in having that conversation. Um, I would like to associate myself with the comments uh, made uh, most recently uh, from members from District 16 and 17 and 39 and only add to those comments to point out that in the last years of reduced government spending, we have um, not only seen on average a cut of 20% across the board per agency with the exception of Health and Human Services and Department of Education, but in that process, we now have 2,100 less state workers working in the state uh, than what were working in the state back in 2015. And we think about the economic impact of 2,100 less salaries uh, circulating the economy. Uh, yes, those cuts have been made, and most of those cuts have been made for good reason, but we have to recognize that the impact of those cuts and the impact of those cuts on the economy of our state of Alaska, that money no longer circulating in the economy is certainly hurting the economy of Alaska. So with that, I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Fields. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Lots of good points. I just want to add that um, in inflation-adjusted per capita terms, which is the most accurate way of measuring operational spending, we are now down to 1970s levels of spending, which takes us full circle right back to the importance of the underlying resolution. So I don't support this amendment, but appreciate the great discussion on the floor. Representative Christ Tompkins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move uh, amendment number one to amendment number three. There's an objection. Representative Christ Tompkins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, amendment number one to amendment number three, I think, speaks to the um, fair underlying point the minority leader is making in his amendment, which is one of the big levers, one of the big variables is how big or small our operating budget is. And there's obviously a conversation about what's uh, what's the appropriate level of spending. Um, I think there's probably bounds of realism uh, that the operating budget co-chair spoke to. We can't live in a, a fantastical world that there's $1.8 billion or whatever it is to be cut from the operating budget because that is clearly magical thinking. Um, but uh, operating budget is one of the variables, and I support downward pressure on the operating budget um, and the hard work the legislature has done to reduce the budget by 45%. But it is one of many components, and I think we all know that. There's maybe you know varying degrees of uh, political possibility to acknowledge that, but mathematically, the only way to get to a balanced long-term budget is a multi-component, sustainable long-term fiscal plan that contemplates the size of the operating budget, yes, but also other components as well. Those components can include revenues, which we have discussed before. They could include a spending cap as a part of a way to control the size of the operating budget. Those components would be part of a fiscal plan, but to single out the operating budget as the one and only greatest threat to the permanent fund, I think is is um, uh, an, an inaccurate analysis um, by by uh, by any common measure, and that's why I offer Amendment Number One to Amendment Number Three. Brief. Will the House please come to order, Mr. Majority Leader? Mr. Speaker, I move and ask unanimous consent that Representative Knopp be excused from the call of the House today. There no objection. The member is excused on the date and the time indicated by the Majority Leader. This time, the House will stand at ease until approximately 1 p.m. They are amendment back. Number one to amendment number three. We were under discussion, is what I recall. And if there are no microphones raised, uh, there is a microphone raised. Representative Zalkowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sorry, just getting caught up after um, our brief recess. Um, I'm inclined to, um, to support amendment number one to amendment number three um, because I feel like a big topic of conversation that is missing from today is really a sustainable plan moving forward. We can't talk just about current levels of spending without really addressing the other side of what balances out a budget. Um, but while I am inclined to support amendment number one to amend amendment number three, um, I do feel like the underlying amendment may still be problematic. So so while I'm supportive of this um, particular amendment to the amendment, I'm not sure about the underlying amendment. Mr. Minority Leader. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I think, you know, and, and sort of, you know, I know there's another amendment coming with uh, some additional uh, thoughts on this. Um, it's hard to kind of just uh, take this and not take into account. We are, we're removing the fact that we recognize that spending is a key piece of the whole conversation. If I were to ask everyone in here, when did we pass the constitutional amendment for appropriation limits? Could you tell me? Some of you could. It was at the exact same time that we created the dividend. They went hand in hand. Almost. Almost. Yeah. yeah. 
they weren't the same measure. But they went hand in hand. The conversation was there. How do you protect the fund? Well, you've heard Hammond's, uh, the, the conversation around Hammond with the dividend. And of course, I think you've got various ideas on how the dividend should continue um, uh, going forward. And that's appropriate. But included in that conversation was, you can't allow growth of government to get to the point where now you're going to look at this fund that we have preserved for the future. And as it currently stands, it, it, thankfully, thankfully it does not work for today because we would be spending so much more than we are. And credit to the many people over the years that have helped uh, keep it under control so that we aren't at the $9 billion or whatever exactly it would be now that that, that limit would be. So I think, though, it, it as we discuss our uh, the conversation here about how do we protect the fund, you can't help but have in there a spending cap, a spending limit, or somehow address how government spending is an aspect to it. As this amendment stands the way that it is, I agree that a sustainable, balanced fiscal term, fiscal long-term fiscal plan is great, but the only way to sh have that as a solid uh, method to prevent that we're not uh, harming the fund in the future is you've got to redress constitutionally because it's in the Constitution you've got to redress the uh, readdress the spending limit and the spending cap and government spending and so I think this just goes a little short if we're going to remove the government spending as a key aspect of, of a, a threat to the fund, and, and I know there were some concerns about the, the exact way under the underlying amendment, the where is the greatest threat. Uh, greatest threat may not be the right terminology. I'll, I'll be frank, this amendment has not gone through any or this this uh, this uh, resolution hasn't gone through any public process. We didn't have any committees hear it. Um, no one came even talk to me about this resolution. There really, it's just it was on the floor, uh, and then a couple days later, it was on the floor for us to, to initially look at. So I, I'm not married to those specific words that people have issues. So we can we can look through the exact way those are, are those particular things on the underlying amendment are addressed. But to not address the government spending, that is the underlying challenge for why we have been battling over the last couple of years with these, these scenarios. The dividend, the fund, and government spending together go hand in hand. They are one and the same. You can't address one and try to protect one without having a discussion about the others. So if it's current spending, if it's uh, if you want to re readdress it and you want to make it so that we're talking about a spending cap, that, that's fine. I'm fine with that. Spending cap is an aspect of this that, that would do the same thing. But to just flat out remove government spending and say we need a plan, well, we've been telling ourselves we need a plan for years, and what does that plan look like? Uh, that plan doesn't necessarily necessarily have at its core a deep conversation about what does the spending that we ourselves uh, will be uh, enacting over the long term uh, look like. And with that, that's my concern. That's why I don't know that I can support this amendment. Um, uh, we might have a different conversation in an amendment that's coming forward. But uh, I, I, act, I appreciate the member for bringing this forward, for trying to kind of uh, come up with a solution that addresses the concern uh, that uh, I think the underlying amendment is trying to get at. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Clayman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to speak just briefly in support of amendment number one to amendment number three. I think that the question about what are our priorities for spending as a government, I, I think the late senator from the hillside used to say we don't have a fiscal problem, we have a priority problem, and the part of that priority problem is where do we fit in the priority for public safety and how high does that rise on our list of priorities, how high do we list make our priority for education funding, what is the priority for essential infrastructure roads, the, the ferry system, uh, government buildings, including school buildings, the university, and 
in that competition is what's the priority for a dividend and how big should that dividend be. Certainly the Supreme Court has told us that all these things must compete when we don't have unlimited funds and that's what we're <laughs> discussing today. But I think the notion that all those things are included in a long-term fiscal plan as, as is proposed by Amendment Number 1, I think, captures all of the different concerns that we're going to have to address as a legislature and with our communities and as a state to decide how do we move forward in a sustainable, effective way that actually makes Alaska a great place for many, many years to come. So I will be pleased to support Amendment Number 1 to Amendment Number 3. Thank you. Representative Prox. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, arise in opposition to the proposed amendment. I, the words long-term, what do they call it, sustainable budget are ambiguous. To one person that might mean taxing people enough to maintain the current level of government spending. To another person that might mean cut the spending enough to maintain current revenue. It's, it's an ambiguous term. So I think we should stay away from those ambiguous terms and just face, uh, well, what I think is the, the, the reason is the spending. Uh, and it isn't as much the spending as who gets to decide. So if, you know, in, in my view, if you return the money to the people, then they can vote on how they want to spend money. But if, if we're taking that decision away from them, we're going to have at some people that are unhappy with whatever decision we make. So it's, it's, it's who's spending the money. Is the legislature spending the money or is the, are, are the people spending the money and deciding how it should be spent? Thank you. And wrap up. No wrap up. Are you ready for the question? And the question being, shall amendment number one to amendment number three pass the body? Members may proceed to vote. <coughs> Clerk, please lock the roll. Does any member wish to change his or her vote? Will the clerk please announce the vote? 20 yeas, 8 nays. So the vote of 20 yeas and 8 nays, amendment number 1 to amendment number 3 has passed the body, which brings amendment number 3 as amended back before the body. Representative Rasmussen. Move amendment number 2 to amendment number 3. Yeah. There's an objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I worked with the uh, previous maker of amendment number one to try to find a compromise that we could support um, with different policy views. I think something to really reflect on is if we want to put our our children and grandchildren in the situation that we currently find ourselves in fiscally. Um, it wasn't long ago that we had more money coming into the state than we knew what to do with. We had oil at over $120 a barrel, and I've heard that people couldn't find enough projects to spend money on. But unfortunately, um, as our spending levels grew, um, we grew to a level that wasn't sustainable when our uh, our revenues dropped substantially and rapidly. Um, we do currently have a spending cap in place, a constitutional spending cap. Unfortunately, it doesn't restrict our state spending to a level that is fiscally sustainable. And I think that this language, um, including the, the spending cap, it, it helps to um, to show that we do have the intention of using the money that we have at the state, even if it isn't directly um, paid to us by taxpayers here in Alaska, it's still the revenue that we have and it still um, gives us the opportunity to show that we're being responsible with Alaskan dollars. So I, I hope that everybody will be able to support this, what feels uh, to be a, a good compromise for this resolution. Thank you. Representative Chris Tompkins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I had some conversations with the maker of amendment number two to amendment number three. Um, and I, I think this relates to the underlying amendment. What is a balanced, sustainable, long-term fiscal plan? Well, 
It's a variety of components, and um, some of those components, as the minority leaders pointed out, is watching the size of the operating budget. One of those components, folks, is going to be new revenues. Um, and I fully recognize that there is a substantial portion of this body for whom a spending cap is an important policy component of a fiscal plan. And, um, you know, I, I've got my own complex thoughts. I'm not foreclosed to the notion of it, and I think it will get its day, day in court, so to speak, in, in the legislature, and I think that's a good thing. Um, but more broadly, I, I think the point that I want to highlight is all 40 of us are going to have to bend a little bit to get a truly balanced budget in the long run. And that might mean bending on revenues, that might be bending on spending cap, that might be bending on other components of a fiscal plan. And so in that spirit, I'll be supporting amendment number two to amendment number three because I think it is a, a precursor to the broader, the broader compromise that we as an institution will have to make in order to get to a truly balanced budget. Will the House please come to order under debate on amendment number two and amendment number three? Representative Josephson. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, I think I'm, I'm inclined to oppose the amendment, and I just want to mention a few things. I mean, uh, the reason, if, if I were to vote in the affirmative, it would be because I, in my own mind, could decide what I think is effective, and effective for what? My concern, and the reason I'm likely to vote no, is that I read effective to mean it must have some effect. Um, well, what's the effect? To, to serve as a spending cap. And my reading of history, um, and I think here of the period from 1929 to 1939, is that one of the ways we got out of the gravest depression in modern history with unemployment of 25% at the height of the depression was to spend money. Uh, that's what Roosevelt did. He spent a lot of money. And although there was a what was called the Roosevelt recession in 37, it had its desired effect. It restored the country to prosperity. Here in Alaska, I'm thinking about well, what is the impact of earthquakes? Would the spending cap consider inflation and population? What about capital development and infrastructure? What if we suffer economic collapse? Would include our right to borrow? What about the deferred maintenance? What about court orders where the court says, you can't spend 600 million on K through 12 because that would take us back to some uh, archaic period we won't let you go back to. What if Anwar is a super giant and, and there's a million barrels a day there? Would it be wise to have a spending cap if the revenue is, is flowing liberally? Those are all things that I think we need to think about. Uh, I agree with the previous speaker that, that there's a place for a spending cap. I know other states have them. But, um, you know, it, it, obviously the nature of the cap would be what's important. But um, I'm inclined to uh, vote against the amendment. Thank you. Representative Kopp. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the uh, member from District 35 has indicated his support for this amendment, I also intend to support it. And I just wanted to remind the body that a spending cap is, certainly it is aspirational. We do have a constitutional spending limit. We know it's about $10 billion. It's way too high. A spending cap is being worked on aggressively in the other body. And we know it can be tied to cost of living. It can be tied to um, rate of inflation. Um, it can be set at a certain amount of revenue. Um, we know we're spending about five point, we will we take in about 5.1 billion in revenue now. A uh, spending cap could say if we, if everything turns around and we take in six billion, um, once we hit that six billion dollar mark, we're gonna put money into savings. Um, just want to remind everyone, this is a very good aspirational statement. It's not saying how we're going to arrive at that, but that it's a good discussion. It's certainly something the public wants. And I think the, uh, the member from Sand Lake uh, it has uh, a good amendment, and it's, uh, it's something that's been widely worked on in the legislature as a whole, and 
This is not saying we agree on exactly what that looks like, but that in concept, we absolutely should have a spending cap in consideration of our budget. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Hopkins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to follow up on the, the comments uh, from District 17, the representative from District 17 and the watching a historical perspective of our spending. Um, you know, if we don't study history, we're bound to repeat it. And uh, the maker of this amendment to the amendment mentioned the money that was spent when we did have oil flowing in. And the, pre the maker of the initial amendment number two to amendment number one, hard to track these, also talked about um, the, the amount of money that we had in the constitutional budget reserve and the, the statutory budget reserve and how much money the, the lawmakers who were down here at the time were able to save. They also spent a lot, has also been previously mentioned. But and when I ran for election uh, in 2018, I, I talked a lot about trying to get us off of the fossil fuel roller coaster, trying to get us to a more sustainable fiscal plan. And I remember working as a legislative aide down here during the time when we did have the oil prices uh, so high that we were flush with spending. And they went on a savings spree, as the buttons in the halls talked about. And they saved a lot of money, but they also did spend a lot of money on some worthwhile projects and some programs that we're now having to cut because we watched the oil prices plummet and put us in the predicament that we're in today. So, Mr. Speaker, I write... a sustainable and predictable and planable, which isn't really a word, but fiscal plan, so our business and our economy can continue to grow, our residents will know what revenue is coming into the future, and we can try to get our state back on track while other states have spending caps. They don't have our budget situation and our revenue situation that is unique to Alaska that allows for the boom and bust economy that can be so detrimental to so many families and businesses in the state. So looking down the line, I want to see that sustainable fiscal long-term plan that also can include a spending cap to, to keep us responsible in where when it comes to our revenue. So uh, I will be voting yes on this amendment, Mr. Speaker. Any rep? Oh, Representative Hannon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, too, arise uh, to think about the impacts of the phrase an effective spending cap. And my concern and why I'm going to vote against this amendment is um, people might say, well, then we should cap our spending where we are today. And I am thinking about the things that are wholly inadequately funded at this point in time. And we can start with road maintenance or operations for ferries or repairs needed to infrastructure and buildings. And I don't feel satisfied capping that and saying we are running Alaska as we should be. And when we look at other states that have spending caps, they are generally tied to specific revenue streams. This road tax is going to pay for the maintenance we spend on roads. This school tax is going to pay for what we spend on schools. But right now, we don't have taxes paying for specific operational needs. And if we have major disasters, or we want to restore the money we've taken from our own savings, or if we want to make sure that the leaky roofs on our buildings and infrastructure are adequately maintained, we can't set a cap right now. So until we tie it to revenue streams like taxes, it's all a philosophical debate, and I don't think we're there yet. I'll be voting no. Representative LeBond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I guess I just need to, to uh, rise in support of this amendment for um, one particular reason, that is uh, the word effective, and I under, underlined it. Uh, what goes into an effective spe spending cap would be economic conditions and variables that take into account growth. And one of the biggest economic factors in growth is population. If this state's population started to grow at a robust level, it means economic development is happening, it means revenues are flowing, it means things are happening. And an effective spending cap should take those economic factors into condition, and I suspect they would. And with that point, I would support this amendment. Any wrap-up comments, Representative Rasmussen? Sure. Um, 
I appreciate um, comments from many of the members today, and I would like to reiterate that um, the use of the word effective was intentional. We currently have a spending cap in the Constitution, and it is ineffective because the level of spending that could be sustained um, can't be supported by the amount of revenue that we have in the state. It can't be supported by revenues that could be raised if we um, decided to implement an income tax to tax the 300,000 working Alaskans. Um, and by using the word effective, we have the ability to work as a legislative body with members from the other body on answering all the questions that were raised by the member from the university area about exactly what that spending cap would look like. There's no definition of what the spending cap would look like. It is, um, it is wide open for us to determine that as a body. So with that, I hope that the members of this body will consider supporting this resolution or the amendment to the resolution. Thank you. Are ready for the question? The question being, shall amendment number two to amendment number three pass the body? Members may proceed to vote. Will the clerk please lock the roll? Does any member wish to change his or her vote? Will the clerk please announce the vote? 25 yeas, 3 nays. With a vote of 23 yeas and 3 nays, amendment number 2 to amendment number 3, it's past the body. <laughs> All the way back to the original sponsor of the amendment, are there any discussions uh, to ensue? Representative Eastman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaking to the new version of amendment number 3, uh, let me just read it briefly so we all know where we're at. This amendment would read, whereas the greatest threat to the permanent fund and the permanent fund dividend is the failure to enact a sustainable, balanced, long-term fiscal plan that includes an effective spending cap. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I will support this amendment, uh, but it must be mentioned that there is, I believe, an equally great threat to the permanent fund and permanent fund dividend that we have not been talking about. We have, have had uh, some very good debate on whether to talk about long-term fiscal plans, whether to talk about uh, spending caps, and I think that is, is good debate and good discussion. Those are important. But Mr. Speaker, I think what is equally important to these, if not more so, is the fact that as I have served in this body, I have watched the amount of trust between this body as an institution and the people we represent erode. And that gap has gotten wider each year that I've been here. Now, there have been some individuals here who have um, heroically sought to close that gap, to engage with their uh, constituents and talk about the discussions we're having here in our committees uh, and the discussions that are, are being had on Main Street. Um, and yet, we have, as an institution, come pitifully short of doing one of two things, either uh, moving closer to the position that some in the public have, or if not doing that, then bringing the public along with where we want to go as an institution. Uh, and we saw that. We saw that in the last legislature with SB 26, which came up earlier today. And there was a desire, I think, probably amongst the majority uh, of this institution to enact some changes. And those were not enacted. And part of that was because it was an election year. Another part was because if we did enact changes, then the people could, through a referendum, uh, have their own say. And that might be very different. And so that gap has remained between uh, what many, certainly in my district, are hoping we do and what the prevailing attitude and opinion is uh, here in this body. If we do not close that gap, Mr. Speaker, we can come up with the perfect plan. We can have a perfect law. It can be elegantly crafted. It can include spending caps that are effective. It can include uh, long-term, sustainably balanced uh, priorities. And yet, if we don't have the people with us, it will come to naught because the people do have the last word. And if we do not bring them along or we do not join them so that we are locked arm in arm, then it will come completely apart. And I think that is what we need to be talking about. That is what, um, unfortunately, has not been talked about yet. Thank you. Any
wrap up comments, Mr. Minority Leader? Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, I think I think the reason I introduced this was not actually to feel good about getting something into a resolution. Uh, although um, I, I haven't been batting very well, so this is uh, this this may, maybe this is an ego boost here uh, if it does pass, but. Um, but really because we need to have the exact conversation that we just had. We absolutely have to have the discussion that we had in here today. If we're going to address the concerns of protecting the permanent fund, we have to talk about the underlying issues. And as much as what I put out there was, was kind of... Uh, you know, I was just trying to figure out what to put out there. I think what we've done here, and hence the reason why I've decided, you know, there for a moment I could have just pulled this amendment. But the fact that we have come together with an understanding that we need to have a conversation about a spending cap. Because spending is a key component of the protection of, of, of talking about the protection of the permanent fund. I think, Mr. Speaker, uh, this, uh, I think this shows that while it's difficult, we can have this conversation. And now that we're sending a letter to ourselves, uh, we will be sending a letter to ourselves saying that we do want to protect it. I think that when we step out of here, whatever happens, the other line of uh, resolution uh, 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 later on, we can't forget that these dialogues, these, these, these interconnected aspects of the budget with the dividend with the fund, we have to talk about them. We have to talk about them openly. We have to talk about them frequently. And we have to address them. A spending cap can, is a key piece of whatever we are going to do to try to ad address this, this challenge. The dividend and a change to the statute, which may be coming forward, I don't know. I know there's been lots of conversations. Sometimes I hear there is, sometimes there's not. You can't deal with that without talking about what we're going to do to prove to the public that we're not just looking for an avenue to grow this, the, the footprint and the scope of government, that, Mr. Speaker, that we ha are saying we recognize that this is a balance. And it's a balance that takes in all of those concerns. And if we do that, everyone together can help bring us to a point of actually protecting the fund and being able to continue to have a robust economic viability through the budget that will pass in the future. So with that, Mr. Speaker, I would ask for support for this amendment. And thank you for uh, all the dialogue and for all the interaction between uh, the various members that offered uh, amendments to this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Get ready for the question. The question being, shall amendment number three as amended pass the body? Members may proceed to vote. Will the clerk please lock the roll? Does any member wish to change his or her vote? Will the clerk please announce the vote? 26 yeas, 2 nays. With a vote of 26 yeas and two nays, amendment number three is amended, has passed the House. Madam Clerk. Amendment number four by Representative Johnson, beginning page two, line nine. I can withdraw amendment number four. Amendment number four has been withdrawn. Madam Clerk. Amendment number five by Representative Johnson, beginning page two, line nine. Representative Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So as we write a letter to ourselves um, with HCR 13. Can you please move the amendment? Excuse me. <laughs> this is my first amendment. Thank you for indulging me. I'd like to move amendment number five. Yeah. There's an objection. No. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Anyway, as we, as we write ourselves a letter, I think there's a there's a song out there. I want to sit right down and write myself a letter. I feel like that's what we're doing today. And um, some of the things that I think should be in the letter is the discussion at least of the, the uh, statutory payout, whether that will stand or, or not. That's what we have right now. So um, the first first few lines there is a uh, is an additional whereas uh, stating that that uh, 
that we've had the, the current statutory formula. And then, then lastly, that the effect of the full payment of the permanent fund has been into our economy has been, been a great fish, uh, benefit to Alaskans. That was at the request of our of a member from District 8. So um, anyway, like I said, these are things I think they're straightforward and non-controversial and um, things I think that are worthy of discussion and being part of the resolution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Christ Tompkins. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Appreciate the amendment uh, being offered and the conversation it engenders. I, I, I don't think I'll be able to support this amendment. Um, I, I, in a certain sense, both of the whereas clauses are sort of statements of fact, so I'm, I'm not disputing that AS 4323025 exists, and, and I think the second whereas clause is a valid point. Um, ICER has done research about the, the economic and socioeconomic benefit of the PFD, and I think about that every day when we consider matters relating to the permanent fund and permanent fund dividend. I, I think it's it's more on a, uh, a macro level that these two clauses feel a bit out of place in terms of the, the thrust and direction of the overall resolution we're considering. And um, I, I think for that reason, it, it, it just uh, it, it sort of uh, takes us in a, a different kind of distracting direction. Um, I, I think it's, it's also worth noting that sort of reading between the lines on the first clause, um, the statutory formula for the permanent fund dividend, um, all equal, it makes sense for us to fo follow our statutes. Um, I very much am of that mind. Um, and un unfortunately, the PFD statute uh, has been one that is not fiscally tenable, at least from my perspective, in the last couple of years. Um, the legislature's made similar findings with a variety of statutes. The um, supposed reimbursement that was supposed to happen in municipalities for senior sales tax exemption. The legislature hasn't honored that for a couple of decades. There's not the level of righteousness or, or ferocity about why this institution has failed to uphold that particular law, which is not an insignificant law. It would mean many tens or maybe even more than that, millions of dollars municipalities, but um, unfortunately, it's a law that has not been followed, yet it's on our books. There are a variety of others, many with great fiscal impact, and so um, I think just reading between the lines on the first whereas clause, right now, the permanent fund dividend statutory formula is not sustainable. Um, it's not fiscally tenable unless you are okay with going into the permanent fund itself, and doing that begins a death spiral fiscally. Um, so, so I, I think, uh, sort of reading in reading between the lines, I think that's a second reason that I struggle to support uh, Amendment Number Five. Representative Eastman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in support of the amendment from the member from the Matsu. I think it is important that we reflect uh, here in this resolution where we're at currently because um, how can we come together under direction that we're going to go if we can't um, be clear about where we are currently. Thank you. Representative Prox. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in support of this amendment and uh, to address the one of the previous speakers' point of sustainability. Uh, you don't, you, you're making an assumption that is not necessarily a foregone conclusion that drawing into the, or paying out the dividend according to the existing statutory formula would require breaking into the permanent fund corpus itself. Um, there's a bill filed in the other body uh, that would enable people to return part or all of their dividend to the general fund. I would expect, well, people can do that now. I don't think it's well advertised, not well understood. A friend of mine actually does. He endorses a check, sends it back to the Department of Revenue. So what it does, what the what this amendment does is returns decisions to the people and that also helps to restore trust. When they have, when people have control of something, they like it better, they trust it more. And that, that's very important. And so this amendment is, is important. I support it. Thank you. Well, please come back to order. 
Turn debate on amendment number five. Any wrap up comments? Representative Johnson? <laughs> Yes, I think that it just, it states, pretty much states the obvious, and um, so, and I wanted to be part of the conversation, so thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're ready for the question. The question being, shall amendment number five pass the body? Members may proceed to vote. Vote clerk, please lock the roll. Does any member wish to change his or her vote? Clerk, please announce the vote. Seven yeas, 21 nays. Edge been celebrating. Amendment number five has failed to pass the House. Madam Clerk. Amendment number six by Representative Carpenter, beginning page three, line five. Representative Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We may have come to the last amendment. Did you want to move the amendment, please? Sorry. Move amendment number six. Yeah, there's an objection. So I want to echo the uh, minority leader's comments earlier. I am uh, thoroughly pleased to be listening and participating in this conversation that is long overdue. Um, all last session I was frustrated that we weren't able to have this conversation and it's good that we do now. The member from uh, District 21 spoke about um, priority problem. And I agree with him. We do have a priority problem, and it's, and it's that <clears throat> inability to identify our priorities that indicates we have to ad address the concept of what essential actually means. The reason that I brought this amendment forward is it adds to the conversation something that we haven't been talking about in regards to um, long-term planning. When everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. And as I, and I think all of you probably are, have experienced, everybody that comes into our office, their issue is a priority, at least to them. And it is up to us to discern where those priorities lie in regards to funding decisions. A long-term plan requires an agreement on what essential means. A spending cap is going to force us to have that conversation about what essential means. This amendment makes us uh, pledge that we're going to define essential services as our Constitution defines essential services. Anything that's in the Constitution is stuff we have to pay for. We must pay for those things that are listed within the Constitution. Anything that's not within the Constitution is therefore not essential. This is a way to look at the problem. If we continue to look at the problem the way we always have, which is whatever we define as essential, it makes it very difficult for us to come to agreement because what is essential to one person is not essential to another. And it's a question of priorities at that point. So Mr. Speaker, I am putting forward some language here during this very important conversation to help us come to a, an agreement on a future fiscal plan where we have identified essential services and identified services that are discretionary. They may be very important, but they are not essential as defined by the Constitution. Our governing document that governs everything we do in this state government is our Constitution. And therefore, essential services shall, should be defined by the Constitution. And anything else that we want to spend on is discretionary. Again, it may be important, but it is not essential. Thank you. Representative Cop. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the, uh, the spirit that the previous representative brings to the, with this amendment. Um, I did want to say that um, a plain reading of the amendment, Mr. Speaker, further resolved, I'm just reading from the language, further resolved that the Alaska State Legislature pledges to fund essential services required by the state constitution and find and fund all other services as discretionary funds allow. Um, you know, a 
plain view reading is that's something worthy of support. We know the dividend is not in the Constitution. It is a discretionary fund service. Our Supreme Court has said it has to fight for funding like every other state agency. But having said that, I also would say that a lot of services are implied in the Constitution but not explicitly stated. So our natural resources certainly is mentioned, uh, fisheries is mentioned, the university is mentioned, uh, public education K-12 is mentioned. I think, Mr. Speaker, there's probably one more. But we have a number of other supporting state departments that are more implied as you read the Constitution in context, but not specifically called out. And we all took an oath already to uphold the Constitution. I don't think we need a resolution to remind us that we took an oath to uphold the Constitution and do these things. And as I said, I do appreciate uh, the spirit that the member from District 29 uh, brings this to us, but um, I, I, I don't know that this really adds to the resolution. And so because of that, I'm not inclined to support it, but also I think that um, I'm not sure if it does exactly what the member intended. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I rise in support of this amendment. Um, I think that it's important to remember when we're thinking about future generations that we constitutionally are mandated to replenish the money that was used in the CBR fund and I've been trying to wrap my mind around how we could possibly do that uh, with the current fiscal climate we've had so I'm hoping that things will improve and I appreciate that this resolution indicates the legislature's um, intent to make sure that we do fund all um, essential services and um, hopefully that would include obligations, I guess, that are uh, required by the state constitution. Thank you. Wrap up comments, Representative Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So in, uh, in regards to whether it, intend, whether it will achieve what I intend or not, we, we shall see if the conversation in this body shifts to further uh, identifying services as essential and those and recognizing those as not essential but important and therefore in a different light than truly essential services, if we can further prioritize our spending decisions, whether this amendment passes or fails, then I have served my purpose. If the member from the other body who's no longer with us identified that we have a priority problem and yet we are unable to dis discern between essential and important, then we will never address our priority problem. This language helps to remind us that we have essential services and we have a document that tells us what those essential services should be. And then we have all of the other problems that we have in our, our state that require our attention and our funds. And those may fall into the category of essential and they may be discretionary. And we may address them this year, or we may address them next year. They get prioritized on how we're going to address them. And as I've sat through two sessions worth of budget discussions, it has come to my attention that we are very myopic in the way that we address finances in our state budget. It is very difficult to prioritize things when the thing you're looking at is essential and then the next thing you're looking at is essential. It's always essential to somebody. We have to have the self-discipline and the, the structure to say here are the things that we require as essential and here is the things that are not on that list. What we are going to do and what we agree to do is just as important as what we're not going to do and what we're not going to pay for. So essential and non-essential non but important is, is an important piece of putting together a long-term fiscal plan. Thank you. Are you ready for the question? Question being, shall amendment number six pass the House? Members may proceed to vote. Will the clerk 
Clerk, please lock the roll. Does any member wish to change his or her vote? Will the clerk please announce the vote? Nine yeas, 19 nays. With a vote of nine yeas and 19 nays, amendment number six has failed to pass the body. Madam Clerk. I have no further amendments, Mr. Speaker. At this time, HC 13 will be held to the next day's calendar. 